Good morning and welcome to the Nakata Tech Talk series. This is a new series sponsored by the Nakata Technology and Advising Commission and we're so thrilled that you can join us. Whether you're here for the live webcast or watching it later, this is a series that's open and access for everyone here in the, as a Nakata membership and academic advising professions. The series here to introduce you to resources. Um, today's topic, we are going to talk around advising reflections and sharing, blogging to support our profession and student learning outcomes. Our esteemed panelists with us today are Esther Chun from the University of Toronto Scarborough, Sally Garner from the uh, University of Oregon, and we, of course, last but not least, have Jason Barkmeyer from the University of Utah. Hello. We're going to give you bigger introductions to all of them. A um, few things that you should know. There are a few chats and conversations and back channels happening. Here in the public chat, if you have a question, we would love for you to share your questions, um, as well as uh, talk amongst yourselves like you already are. That's great. Uh, we will be parking those questions for later as we'll hold it off until we have the short presentation. We'll have a Q&A session for all the panelists. The second area, if you are on Twitter, we are using the hashtag ADVTECH, Advise Tech. So if you're tweeting out there, use that hashtag and ch uh, chirp along with the rest of us. We're going to take questions from both and we will save them for the end of the session. So without further ado, let me introduce our first our first blogger and panelist, Sally Garner. Some of you may know Sally. She has been blogging for some time. She is currently the Director of Student Services for the School of Journalism and Communication at the University of Oregon. A NACADA member since 2006, she has served on every Region 8 conference planning committee since 2008. She loves conferences. She's a member of the 2011-2013 Emerging Leaders Program and has served as a communications coordinator on the Region 8 Steering Committee since 2010. Starting in October, she will serve as the 2012-2014 Region 8 Chair. Go figure. Good for you. Um, she's tweeting at Sally. Under, under, <laughs> underline Garner, and she also will be talking today about where she blogs. Welcome, Sally. The floor is yours. Thank you, Laura. Hello, everybody. It's so lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm here today. I officially work at the University of Oregon, but I'm here today actually representing Region 8 as the communications coordinator. I'm created and maintained the Nakata 8 Word, uh, WordPress blog. And so that's in that capacity that I'm talking to you all today. Um, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm, OK, Laura, you're right. I'm totally distracted by the chat. So I'm going to not look at the chat field right now and just move on. So if all of you are Nakata members, this map should look fairly familiar to you. This is the breakdown of Nakata's regions. And if you look at the geography, uh, Nakata Region 8 probably has the largest geography, if you add it all up. I think six maybe kind of rivals us a little bit, but um, we like to say we are the largest geographically, but region-wise, well, membership, we're, kind of, we're one of the smaller regions, and so our membership is really, really spread out. So the steering committee really wanted to find a way to connect with our membership as spread out as we are. And in 2009, um, as part of the, when we were in Montana for our conference, Go Montana, um, we decided to form a blog subcommittee to look into the possibility of setting up a blog. Um, because as you may or may not know, the official Nakata website um, and all the email lists, um, it all just has to be distributed through the executive office. And that takes time. There's also kind of a specific structure that, they, that we have to follow. So there's not a lot of thinking outside of the box. Um, so we wanted a little bit of freedom. We wanted a little bit of, um, we wanted a little bit of flexibility in, in how we wanted to reach um, members. And so the blog was formed, uh, we launched, um, let's see, the meeting was in April 2009, the blog subcommittee did some work in May 2009, and in June 2009, a blog was born. There was really uh, no, um, nothing, let's see, nothing scientific really about why we chose WordPress over any of the other blog, um, I don't even know what to call them. 
outlets out there. Um, two, I think, of the subcommittee members had a personal blog on WordPress, so that's pretty much why we chose WordPress. And so that uh, worked, and it's worked out really well for us. Um, so as you can see, again, we're spread out. Um, we're definitely um, one of the larger regions according to geography, and so we wanted to connect with our members. So the blog was born, and initially we didn't really know what to do with it. We, um, it took us a while to find our voice. For a while we were just kind of posting announcements about an upcoming event. Um, slowly, we started working in profiles of uh, the steering committee members, um, our award winners. We did a profile of Jennifer Jocelyn when she was uh, appointed to the board of directors. This was definitely before her presidentship, which reminds me, Jennifer, if you're in the room, we need an article from you for the blog. Uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Um, and so, again, initially, just kind of announcements, things like that, we began to kind of what I like to call humanize the blog a little bit with kind of longer features um, on the uh, committee members, on our award winners, and, you know, um, and people in Region 8 who are doing great things. And then, we, you know, we discovered that this, the blog was actually a great way to kind of ramp up to a conference. And what I mean by that is we got close, as we got closer and closer to a regional conference, the blog was a great way to kind of get people excited about it. We started using it to announce our service project, which actually increased participation in our service project, which was great. Uh, we, we used the blog to announce keynote speakers, and we used the blog to kind of announce hospitality uh, opportunities and things like that. So recently, I would say, the blog has kind of been a mix of, yeah, the announcements that happen throughout the year that we think the region memberships um, would be really interested in, and that would include things like um, state conferences, drive-in uh, events, and things like that. Uh, we also want to uh, um, celebrate regional accomplishments. We did a pretty long blog post um, after the annual conference in Denver, kind of celebrating everything that Region 8 um, did in, in Denver, which was great. And then we started taking members kind of behind the scenes um, of the site visits that we do to kind of secure the, uh, the future conferences. So uh, Judy Haskins and uh, Nicole Kent and I, Judy Haskins from Montana, Nicole Kent from Oregon State and I, went to Alaska recently to, um, to do a site visit and where the regional conference is going to be in Alaska in 2013. That's a plug right there. And uh, we, so we did a site visit and we did some um, kind of sightseeing tours a little bit and we, we kind of blogged on that as well. Um, we also did some site visits to Coeur d'Alene, Utah, and also to uh, Vancouver, Washington. Uh, I'm sorry, Vancouver, British Columbia. Hello, Can Canada. And so, you know, we blogged about that as well. So that was kind of our way of kind of bringing the membership into kind of the behind the scenes of what goes into putting up a regional conference and how they might participate, how they might get excited about it. Um, the blog traffic, as you can see from this graph, you really, I don't really expect you to see the numbers. Um, really, the representation of that, that chart going up and down is pretty much how the, the, the traffic kind of fluctuates. The peaks there are really when we have the, uh, the regional conferences. So you can see it really kind of ramps up towards a regional conference, and then the traffic kind of dies down again. Um, since we started, um, as, as the slide says, we've had almost 9,000 visits to the blog. Um, and this year, we're probably going to exceed 3,000. We, we had 3,000 last year. Um, if you were in yesterday's talk, Eric Stoller would say this, you know, these, these, these tags are just vanity. You know, these numbers are just vanity. And you really want to see kind of the influence of your impact of your blog is whether or not people are reading it. Um, comments on the blog are actually really rare. We only get a few of those. They are moderated, but they're pretty rare. The feedback that we're getting is really just from the membership. In talking to our, you know, to, talking to our membership, we know there's an increased awareness around the keynote speaker, around the service projects, around hospitality options. Again, as we're ramping up to a conference, 
Um, you know, it's a great way to kind of highlight our host city. Um, for example, our last regional was just in Portland, Oregon, and our hospitality subcommittee actually did a great series of blog posts around things that you could do in Portland if you're a new, uh, you know, if you're a new visitor to Portland, a Portland bucket list, as it were, the things that you absolutely have to do in Portland while you're there. So things like that. So we get feedback through our membership. We get feedback through Twitter as well uh, on the hashtag uh, Nakata R8. We don't actually have our own um, Twitter account. We just use the hashtag for that. So that's kind of the Nakata 8 WordPress.com blog in a nutshell. Uh, it's a couple of years. It's been a couple of years old now. It's been my baby for a little while, but I'm going to be passing this on to the next co uh, communications coordinator, and I'm excited to see where the next person is going to take this blog. Cool. Very cool. Thank you so much, Sally. And you know what? There's been some great comments. Um, region 8's not the only one blogging. Nakata Region 2 has been doing uh, Tech Talk Tuesdays and blogging as well. And word on the street says Region 5 is coming live with their own blog. So what a surprise. There may be more regional community blogs. So thank you for sharing, Sally. Appreciate it. Uh, we will take questions. So if you have questions for Sally, I'll, I'll be saving them for later, but please post them here. Um, and we'll talk specifically at the end, and I'll save those questions for her. On to our next panelist. We would love to welcome, uh, we have Jason Barkmeyer, who is uh, doing so much in blogging the blogging world for himself. Jason is currently an academic advising coordinator and director of the Peer Advising Program at the David Eccles School of Business at the University of Utah. He has been advising students in higher education since 2003, starting with the student athletes at Texas State University. He relocated to Utah and has been with the Eccles School since 2006. He's an active member with the Nakata uh, Advising Association. He, since 2010, he's been presenting on distance advising for students. He was awarded the best in region at the Nakata region, um, the region, was it five or six? And the, an, the annual conference. And his advising interests lie in the realm of using technology to supplement academic advising and supporting the advising as a profession and as a whole. So having a background in journalism and the need to find an outlet through writing, Jason's going to share his story on how, why and how he maintains his personal blog um, and his reflection of advising in higher education, which will share his advisorbark.wordpress.com link. So Jason, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laura. Um, just let me say welcome to everybody in, in the room. Um, thank you to Laura and the executive office for a great week of tech talks. I, I've enjoyed them all week long. So. Thank you for that. And um, my blog, Ruminations and Pontifications of a Higher Ed World, really long title, um, made it for no particular reason outside of, like I said, I, I ramble and I'm random, and, and that's really the way my brain works sometimes. And, and so um, it, it stung to me when I, when I chose that title, but really when it comes um, to my, my personal blog, it, it's really born in my background. And so I, I want to just quickly share with you my background just so you understand where my influences come from my personal blog and and what drives me to, to write what I write. As Laura mentioned, I've, I've been in some larger public institutions for the past nine years or so and I have a degree in education and journalism, I'm active in NACADA and the National Association for Athletic Academic Advisors and our, our state advising uh, organization as well. Um, over my time in advising, I've really kind of honed in on a couple of research um, interest areas, and those being advisor development, the occupation of academic advising, and the use of technology in advising, which is why I, I'm enjoying being here today. Um, prior to that, I worked in newspapers and publications for seven years, starting in high school all the way up into a professional journalism job, um, working at a daily newspaper writing sports. So. Uh, I, I wrote for a, a really long time. It was kind of my first love. When I found it in high school, um, I knew that's what I wanted to do. I went to college and I was the student who didn't change his major at all. I just changed my career after I got a job. So, um, But past, past writing, I also have blogged in, in, in pop culture on a staff of six, six writers. I, I, I maintain my own food blog as well and, and then ruminations along with that. And so, like I said, I just want you to kind of see where I came from to what, what drives me to write. It, it is that background in journalism, 
plus you wrap in what I'm currently doing with the School of Business, uh, with the Athletics Department, and with our peer advising program. Um, just joined uh, a couple of us together on campus to form the Utah Advising Research Committee as well, and transitioning out of a two-year role in our campus advising group. Um, and so when it comes to what I write, um, like I said, it, it's usually a reflection of what is happening around me right now. Uh, I take um, influences from my coworkers, from what's happening on campus, what's, what's happening in the conferences I attend, the random news that I catch on a website somewhere, um, and that's what, what drives me to write. And, and it really is geared towards my fellow advisors out there and not so much my students. I don't know any of my students who would actually enjoy reading what I write right now because it has no relevance to them, but I, I hope it is relevant to the advising field. Um, and it really is more, I, I term it stream of, stream of consciousness when I write because I write and it just kind of flows out of me onto the text and, and hopefully at the end of writing it I have something. So it's not academic or research based in, in any means, it's just me um, conversing with, with the reader. Um, but I did need that outlet to write, and, and for a while while I was working with student athletes at Texas State, I, I kind of took a break from it. And, and when I got up to Utah, it was something I, I felt that I needed to do, and, and I needed to find the right, right outlet for it. And, and like Sally, my, my blog is actually in WordPress as well. And I feel that even though these are my personal reflections and, and just random thoughts on the matter, I'm hoping that they lend credence or maybe even a little bit of guidance to one other advisor out there who might find themselves in a similar situation. Um, and, and, you know, readership, I, I get maybe five a day, you know, on days where I hit a hot topic, it may get up to 40 or 50, but it's, it's not reader driven by any means. It's really just a means for me to express what I need to. Um, but the nice thing I, I found about my personal blog is it's really given me a ground to kind of test some of those hot topics. Uh, um, I recently wrote a blog on breaking some bad news to students and, and it seemed to catch some traction on out there and I, what I wound up doing is taking that blog post, fixing it a little bit, tweaking it a little bit, and um, I was lucky enough to have it accepted by Academic Advising Today. So it really has proved to be kind of this testing ground and, and development ground for more academic writing in other venues. And, and the one thing I really like about it is my blog doesn't cost me any money outside of my time. And, and you can make it cost money if you want to, but it's not necessary. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to give you a, a, a quick kind of what, what is my blog, what does it look like, what can you expect, you know, driving a personal blog of your own. Uh, it's all customizable, as you can see here. Mine's pretty straightforward. Uh, pick some things, it always has my my, my current um, article up at the top, and you can really customize the modules on the side so you can see who, what, what topics are your, your hottest, you know, who's commenting on what. Um, and so you can see a couple of the topics I've written about recently, right? So we recently went through hiring a new advisor in our office, and I kind of gathered the topic of discussion as we went through that entire process and said, you know, if you're asking yourself that question, how do I become an academic advisor? Here's what we went through in our process, and hopefully you can kind of take away from that and apply it to your job search going forward. Um, behind more behind the scenes, you can see that it, it is pretty straightforward. You can get pretty technical if you want. There's a lot of analytics with WordPress. There's um, a lot of tracking and a lot of customization, but if you want to get in and just start going, you can post from day one and not really have to worry about, about anything. Um, as you can see, I've I'm only about 45 posts now since this here, and, and I, I post when I have time. It's on top of everything else I, I do in my job. It's not part of my job, um, but I enjoy doing it. Um, and, I, and I use this feature quite a lot. It's off to the side in your administration panel, but as ideas come to me in, in areas that I want to write with, what I do is I just kind of come in here real quick and, and, and put, it, put a title down and save the draft, and so I know kind of where my brain was at at some point in the day. And so if I have a desire and an energy to come back and write on a certain topic, I just pick it up and I, I don't have to pull it out of the ether and just write anew. Um, and so 
with a personal blog, and for me it really is personal. Um, sometimes I, 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 I'm lucky enough to, to write something on my lunch break. I have a very supportive director who, who likes um, what we as an office give back to Nakata's and is supportive. If you know, I need to take 30 minutes to an hour to, to write something new for my blog, he's all right with it. He sees the benefit in it, and I hope everybody out there sees the benefit as well. Um, just some tips, you know, for starting your own personal blog. And um, I think you really need to find a theme and a voice when you start writing a blog. Um, my, my theme is higher education with more of a focus on academic advising um, because that's what I do professionally. Um, if you want to write about your life, that's great. But really, I think you need to pick a theme and set, um, stick with it. Um, that will drive your readership so to expect what is to come out of you. Um, and I think you need to realize who you're writing to, meaning if you're writing to a bunch of um, directors, you want to make policy, I think you need to be a little bit more academic in your writing rather than, um, rather than just kind of the way I approach it with you know, suggestions and um, non-academic pieces. Um, you really do have to set aside some time for your writing, whether it's at work, after work, at night, midnight when you're just sitting around on a couch not doing anything. Uh, and that's in order that you do post fairly consistently because the one thing in ebbs and flows in all of our time, it's going to be hard to write you know, at a clip of once a week. I, I try and post at least once a month, if not more, but um, sometimes it's hard, even more when you, know, you hit orientation, you hit um, other pieces of your job that just seem to consume your time. Um, and sadly, I don't have a copy editor on staff, and so I have to edit my own blog, and I think it just lends a little bit of credence to what I'm writing to my fellow advisors. Um, and I draw a lot of inspiration from the other blogs out there. I, I subscribe to Region 8's blog. Um, it was great leading up to their conference, uh, and I've continued to read it ever since. And it gives me a, a lot of good ideas on what I can write about, a lot of topics. So I say don't be a stranger to the other blogs out there. It, it will lend you some direction in what you can write on. And you know, you control your entry into the world of the internet. You know, you're not going to have a thousand readers reading your blog from day one. If you don't want anybody reading it, don't tell anybody about it. And that's the great thing about it. But as you go along, perhaps you pick up a couple of those um, colleagues and confidants who, who will read it and provide feedback on what you do. And I think the best thing with this is just have fun with it. You know, it, you know in a more professional setting where it's part of your job, sometimes it's hard to see that. But with a personal blog, really, you I am back. I don't know who else is. I'm Laura Pasquini, too. I'm with also the second... I'm Jason, too. That's great. We're new and improved. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. So we'll wait for other people to get back in. Oh, people are back now. Yeah, they are our clones, Bobby. That's correct. Uh, squared. <laughs> I hope we're not... I don't want to cube to me. <laughs> Uh, everyone else is almost there. Um, I will, we're going to let everyone else get back in. Cool. And let's get back to tips. And, and yeah. your final thoughts. I, this um, is great, Jason. Keep going. Yeah, Yeah. I really, I was on my last one, and that's just to have fun with it. You need to give yourself the energy to keep going with it. And if, you, if you're not having fun, why do it? So, um, But that was basically, it cut out right at the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Um, we are getting people sharing, which is great. If you are blogging, ask the question. Please share your blog, because I know myself and Jason like to read others, and that helps us blog. So, awesome. Great. Um, so, you guys want to blog? Uh, we shared is advisorbark.wordpress.com. And so, let me go ahead, and I don't know if there's an extra, is there an extra picture on here? Yep, the next one. Oh, yeah. Awesome. So let me introduce our next panelist. Uh, the good news with this webcast, we will be uh, cutting out the little bits and pieces that we want edited, so it'll look pretty later. 
All right, so let's move on to our third bloggers. And it looks like there's lots of other bloggers out here. But let me tell you about our third panelist, Esther Chun. Uh, she has been fortunate enough to be stuck working with me before. But Esther uh, has a great background. Let me tell you about her. She, her diverse professional experiences includes empowering and educating clients in the social service sector, career development, and higher education. She currently works as an academic advisor at the Academic Advising and Career Center at the University of Toronto Scarborough. She may have been given my job after I left. <laughs> which is awesome. And help, she helps students with their academic and career journey. At UTSC, uh, the school specializes in using electronic resources and social media to help students with academics, study skills, career, employment matters. Her recent ventures include a project in content management, so developing the current website that you see at UTSC for the Advising Career Center, an online chat, a blog, social media, and cyber counseling. She completed a master's in arts and science degree in the community college with a research focus on student development from the central from Central Michigan University while doing all these phenomenal things at UTSC. And she's currently working on her second master's in counseling psychology at the University of Toronto because she's very ambitious. Welcome, Master. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the uh, great intro. And it's true, I pushed Laura out to get a job. <laughs> Um, so, uh, thank you very much for inviting me for uh, this chat, uh, this talk, and mainly today what I'm going to be talking about is our blog um, at the Academic Advising and Career Center. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my partner in crime, Elin Chen, um, who I work very close, closely with uh, at the um, IRIS Center, uh, can is not available today, so she's not here. Uh, but essentially, at our center, there's the um, what I focus on is the academic and the learning skills, um, and she focuses on the uh, current and employment. And here's my contact information and our blog. Uh, if you're interested, um, you could take a look, and if you could just um, message me um, uh, after the chat if you have any questions. So I wanted to actually um, tell you a little bit about the um, the university I work for. It's located in Toronto. It's one of the three campuses. Um, right now, we have about um, 11,000 students, um, and students actually come from 150 different countries. So we have a very diverse uh, student population, um, and we are actually one of the 37 services um, uh, available on campus. And what's astounding is that since 2002, um, we have seen a huge enrollment growth. Uh, so essentially, we've added about 6,000 students since 2002, so that's about 53%. So, you know, just imagine the amount of workload, not just the workload, but the amount of students that who've come to UTSC and, and who we have to help. And one of the ways that we try to bridge the gap is by uh, using online resources like the blog. And our campus very much focused on um, experiential education, so we are known as a co-op campus. Um, and we have 11% percent of our population, student population, actually are international students. Uh, so even when they're not on campus, um, overseas, or back at home, um, they still try to contact us and connect with us to get help. Um, and blog is, uh, I find that it's a really good way to connect uh, with the students even when that they're not in Toronto. Um, and the other thing is uh, we have a huge commuter student population. So a lot of the students, it's not uncommon for uh, students to you know, drive or commute three to four hours a day just to come to class and, you know, go to work, go back home. Um, they have a lot of different responsibility. So trying to engage the students and um, trying to connect with the students, I find that that's really challenging at times. Um, so that is one of the reasons why we do use um, electronic resources. Um, and, you know, the reason why we blog is essentially um, we live in a digital world, and a lot of our student population, they start using um, the internet and the computer at a young age. Um, so we wanted to use something that will help them to engage with the university, um, th something that is, you know, they're comfortable with. And that's one of the reasons that we use the blog. Um, and when we're using the blog, we want to go beyond social um, and promoting different kind of events or activities or resources that are on campus. Of course, that's really important. 
Um, and we found that maybe even Facebook or Twitter might be a better tool in promoting those kind of resources and activities. Uh, what we're trying to do with the blog is to increase engagement um, and help students to navigate, especially um, from high school to university. Uh, one of the major programs, programming that we do actually is um, academic orientation for incoming students. So we promote the blog and different kind of resources to them um, and to build a community and enhance their skills and knowledge. So rather than um, just updating, um, you know, on Facebook you could update your status message to a share um, a couple of lines. But with a blog, it's um, you could go a little bit more in depth in terms of sharing um, tips on resume writing or selecting courses or making a good decision about their academics or career issues. Um, so that's why uh, one of the reasons why we use this. And I remember um, as a university student, um, you know, I was one of those students who was really disengaged from the university and um, I didn't have the best experience and I think that's one of the reasons why um, I have so much vested interest in trying to engage students who are commuter students because I was one of those commuter students who was, you know, um, so lost at times. Um, and having a tool like this really helped the students to know who's available, um, that there there is help available, and they could hear from different people at the university. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the evolution of the blog. Uh, so in the beginning, there was ACE, uh, that's our mascot, Academic Korean Explorer, um, and Laura and Yilin. So Laura is the person who actually created ACE and started this blog. Um, and uh, in 2009, unfortunately, she left us. and. Um, we really miss her. <laughs> uh, but since then, I, I've taken over the blog, and uh, Elena and I have been working on um, the blog together. And for the next three years, um, we try to, we were basically pretending to be ace and, you know, um, uh, creating posts. Uh, and slowly, you know, we, we found that it wasn't really working out. And within the last year, we um, decided to use student bloggers, and, you know, they blog uh, posts uh, from their own perspectives. Uh, we've used uh, peer counselors, so we have study and uh, employment peers. So they share different kind of issues that they're going through from a personal perspective. Um, and I found that, uh, we both found that, you know, the, the number has hits went up, which means that more people are reading and more people are engaged um, with the blog, uh, which is really great. Uh, so I guess they don't want to hear from a mid-30-year-old <laughs> uh, staff pretending to be ace. Uh, they would much prefer to uh, hear from a student uh, perspective. Um, so this is actually what our blog looks like. Uh, so at this point, we have a Facebook account, so we have a link for that. Uh, we also have YouTube videos um, and, as well as a uh, website um, uh, that we've created, Ilan and I created. Um, and this is uh, one of the um, uh, blog posts um, from our blogger. Some of the popular posts uh, include uh, grad school, professional school, or post-grad diploma. So a lot of students, you know, um, struggling with their decision, for example, to do what to do, on what to do after university, you know, they could read about this post and, you know, look for some resources on the blog post. Um, one of our um, student bloggers, Faria, she actually blogged about extracurricular activities and my sanity. And I thought that was really clever because she talks about how uh, focusing just on the academic, um, she couldn't achieve a, a you know balance in our life, and she used extracurricular cur curricular activity to actually uh, achieve some balance and, and gain some sanity back and and get some enjoyment out of it. Um, another topic was social media job killer extraordinaire. So how social media affects you know students' ability to uh, chances of getting a job, for example. Uh, study tips to prepare you for your final fancy schmancy. In interview prep and so on and so forth. So, you know, with these kind of uh, blog posts, I found that um, we've had a lot more positive uh, responses uh, from the students. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to just quickly touch base on the platform that we are using. It's called the Blogger. Uh, we use a lot of the tools uh, from 
Google, so that's um, one of the benefits of uh, using the blogger. Uh, we do look at the analytics and page views uh, referring URL, and that's really helpful in looking at who's reading it, when are they reading it, um, and where they actually uh, refer from. Um, so this this actually gives you a lot of information. And it's very simple to use. Um, so you know, for anybody who's not even tech savvy, um, you know, I, I I was I had to teach myself how to do, how to become tech savvy, and this was a really great tool. Um, so lastly, what we learned in the fa past five years is that um, Blogger is a really great tool um, and it, you know that you could use to engage students. Um, let them know that, you know, to let them know that there are actually issues that they're going through that's very common. You know, it's not just them that are going through a, a tough time in their courses, not getting the grades or the results that they're looking for. You know, when you have peer bloggers or other people talking about the same kind of issues and talking about how they overcame that by, you know, looking at different kind of resources or tips, um, I find that that really gives them a chance to connect with um, a, a different population on campus, especially with the peer uh, mentors that we have on campus. Um, and students really like to repost from um, their own peers rather than staff. Um, one of the things I, I know I read one of the comments that you know you only have 24 hours. How do you do it? Um, you can't do it alone. That's what we learned. Like we, Elin and I, try to do it by ourselves, and we found that you know there's not enough time because we have full-time jobs. And um, at GTSC, we only have six academic advisors for 11,000 students. So you decided, you know, just use the students. You know, they're great at, at what they do, especially the senior students, um, and they've been really, really. Um, uh, we have a really good uh, positive response to them blogging, um, and it takes time. It it didn't happen overnight. You know, building an audience, reaching out to students, it took a while, and um, you know that took a little time. So you really have to hang in there uh, and find different ways to promote the blog. So we, whenever we blog, uh, there's a new post. We use Facebook to uh, promote to our our um, fans uh, on Facebook. And that actually drives the numbers up. And also, we go to different events and try to um, uh, use our websites. So that has been really helpful uh, in uh, promoting the blog. So that's pretty much it for me. I was just typing this after I think you could turn them with your ratio of advising to students. Uh, Canadian models of advising are very different than American models and European models. So uh, advising is not mandatory, so don't freak out. As you said, they have like 4.2 or now six advisors for 11,000? Yeah, 11,000 students. And I think we are kind of moving towards the mandatory, but um, yeah. we'll see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a job if I want to come back? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Um, I'm so happy to have the three of you here because you provide different lenses and perspectives, blogging for community, uh, professional and regional development, personal reflection, journey, writing, and experience and sharing, which I've appreciated from Jason, as well as Esther, getting the students involved and driving traffic and interest by students, for students. I think it's great. So we have some questions, obviously. Uh, I'll do it in order, because there were some questions based on what you did. So I'll start with Jason. There was a question during your section. I'll take questions via the ch public chat here and on Twitter. Um, so feel free to tweet or I am, and I'll do my best to catch it. Uh, question for um, Jason. This is for um, Amanda Sherbaum from Twitter. She said, how do you toe the line between writing about situations you encounter and maintaining confidentiality? I think Jason's paused. Um, I'm here. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> it just took a little bit to catch the mic. Um, you know, when, when I approach confidentiality, I, I really have made a conscious decision to steer away from really speaking about student-specific situations um, or even situations that in involve my office uh, as a whole. Because um, the one thing I realize is that I never know who, who will wind up reading my blog. So what I write is out there really for everyone to see and 
I'm directly accountable for it. So uh, it's it's hard, um, but I try my best not to approach personal situations, but go more to a, a, a global, broad view of the problem as a whole. No, that you uh, you make a good point. Um, for those of who, who blog professionally, maybe talk about a profession because you actually had a good post around changing roles and your experiences. So you kind of I think balance that a little bit more. And um, maybe someone who's not talking on our mic will tweet out that link. But changing roles as an advisor is a great one to read. Um, just giving an experience, but doing it diplomatically, but being honest and genuine. I think at the same time. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Um, let's, You're welcome. I have a question for Sally. This came from Franklin Pierce University. Uh, communication coordinators have other tasks too, or just the blog? So when you talked about management of the blog um, in your, your regional role as a conference chair and regional chair, uh, what other um, mediums do you have as a communications coordi coordinator, or what do those responsibilities look like if they want to set it up in other regions? Sally? Um, okay, so the communications coordinator position for Region 8 um, cre um, maintains content for the regional website and also um, in conjunction with the region chair also, you know, writes the emails that go out to the, um, to the membership. Um, everything has to be filtered through the executive office, but we provide the content for that and we send it over to the executive office. So the website, any email um, announcements that go out, now that we have the blog, um, uh, I'm responsible for that as well. Um, we do have a Facebook page now. Our technology coordinator created that, but um, the communications coordinator is also an admin to that Facebook page, and so we post, um, we post content to that as well. So anything that allows the steering committee or the conference planning committee to reach out to the membership, chances are the communications coordinator has kind of a finger in that. It's helpful for me that I, like Jason, also have a journalism background, so the steering committee kind of turns to me as their copy editor to make sure everything looks okay before it gets sent out to the membership. So if you can, anything that has to do with communication for the region and reaching out to the membership pretty much falls on that position. No, that, that's great, and you make a good point. Um, you you want to tap into people that have those skills and interests if you are going to be blogging. Um, one question for Esther, and then I'll, I'll throw it over to everyone else as well. Um, a compliment from Townsend University, Esther. The graphics and layout on the blog are outstanding, so kudos. The, the redesign looks wonderful, I, by the way. So thank you for right, taking it and evolving. I love what you guys are doing. Um, a question from Tamara, too, who's like Jason and I. We're, we're the second best for squared. <laughs> Does everyone use a filter for reading responses? So, And the question, I think, was around um, management of the blog, because you have multiple authors, editors. Do um, you want to share a little bit around that workflow and experiences? Um, with our student bloggers, um, we, with our peer counselors, uh, when they blog, they blog for the fall and winter semester, and we've hired a, a new set of um, uh, students for the summer. So when they first start, uh, we have a casual discussion about what the previous blogs have been. Um, and I do kind of um, ask them to create a sample blog uh, and send it to me so we could talk about you know, the voice um, and um, the type of writing and, um, and the title and the content of the uh, blog beforehand. And we have a, a discussion about what kind of uh, blogs um, they want to talk about in the future. But we do try to give them that creative room so that they could cre um, uh, write the blog uh, and post it. And they're, it's up to them to post it themselves. I don't always check their blogs before they post it. I will give a shout out to Bill Morrill who said you don't always need a journalism background to blog. There, there's lots of Spanish majors. We have a lot of students that are interested in different majors all around um, to start blogging and telling their story. So absolutely. Good point, Bill. Thank you for ke keeping us in line. Um, let's talk about some questions from the group. Uh, 
that anyone can answer this. You can raise your hand and go. I don't. I don't mind. I'll, um, Janine Fazel said, "With only 24 hours in a day, how do you find the time for all the routine assignments of a job and still do all the social media things?" With I'm going to focus it just to blogging, uh, but interconnecting Facebook and Twitter if you do that. And I think all three of you could probably answer how you best share. We'll start with Jason. Um. It's it's really when I come across my my downtime that I write, um, and, and sometimes I, I just have to see when <laughs> when the energy hits me and and I feel this need to just sit down and, and get it get it out of my head and into a text box really. Um, ha juggling is always hard because you know full time job, but I also have a family which is which does take up a, a lot of my time. But I've always personally I've always been a, a night owl. So it's not uncommon for me to be awake at, at midnight, one o'clock, after everybody's already gone to bed in the house. So I'll just sit down and unwind. And I really use writing as a, a tool to unwind rather than, than wind up. Um, that really allows me to, to, to calm down at the end of the night. So. That's right. Save those heated ones for early morning writing. Exactly. Sally, what is, what's your thoughts on like, finding the time or finding routine or finding space to write? And blog. Um, I all my Nakata um, responsibilities are done outside of my office hours, generally. And um, like Jason, sometimes the need is just there to to reflect on something. Uh, and that 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 especially hit when I was in Alaska and I couldn't sleep and I really just needed to blog about the experiences of the day. Um, so. With, with our blog, a lot of times half the content really comes from someone else, and so my responsibility is just to, um, you know, throw up a couple pictures, make it look pretty, edit for content, and then post. So a lot of times it doesn't take me very long, but some of the longer features where I'm interviewing somebody or uh, doing a reflection on the day, that can sometimes take a little while. But again, I, I kind of feel the way Jason does in some ways. I just need this outlet. Um, I don't have a personal blog, and um, you know, I don't write short stories anymore. Apparently now I blog. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. And Esther, how do you kind of manage this? Because um, actually, can you share with them about your position? It's built into your position. So I don't know if you've talked about your position description or how maybe someone changed it for you before they left to Texas. Thanks, Laura. Um, so. Part of my job is actually um, looking after the web website uh, content and um, e-resources uh, tools that we use for uh, with the students um, in, within regards to academic career areas. Um, so Elin and I really work closely together. Um, and what we decided to do is because there's so many different projects on the go right now. Right now, we have um, Facebook, Twitter. Um, the blogger, we're uh, looking to revamp the um, uh, the website again, going from Joomla to Drupal. Uh, we have YouTube uh, videos that we are creating. Uh, we're doing online chat pilot at the moment, um, and we're thinking about doing webcast. So it keeps going on and on and on. So what we decided to do with within the team, um, we divided our tasks. So there's a lead for, let's say, um, looking after the Facebook or Twitter or um, uh, YouTube videos and whatever it may be, uh, and we reconnect to to look at what our strategic plans are uh, on a regular, on a yearly basis. I would say, um, and look at what we should focus on. Um, so it's looking at what's the priority. How do you you know and and dividing it up so that it, the work is divided, not just one person doing it by themselves, and also utilizing student resources too. Um, uh, because we only have so 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 much staff power, um, we like to use students, uh, give the students opportunity to build experience and knowledge uh, by you know writing for the blog or or the Facebook or you know um, hiring marketing assistants um, to looking after um, these things. 
And uh, yeah, all of you have different ways and why you blog, and some of you are blogging in teams. Um, I blog in a couple different areas, and I, I'll just share mine, because I, I probably blog at least once a week or twice a week, and I blog at technotools.wordpress.com. If someone wants to share that while I talk, that'd be great. Um, and so I blog on higher ed, some advising, some... Um, uh, technology, some learning concepts. Um, I blog to reflect on what I'm learning. So my my current role on campus, one of them, I'm a student, and I I, and I am re being reflective in my practice and what I'm reading and writing and considering. Um, and then I also want to share just some resources that I get from others. So I probably share one or twice a week, uh, one to two times a week. Um, and finding an audience, with, which Amanda mentioned on Twitter, Amanda Sherbaum, um, finding a voice. I've decided I'm going to share many voices and things. So I like a lot of things. So my audience is open. I talk to higher ed folks as well as education, as well as training development in the corporate sector. Um, so I, I, I'm open to sharing across different areas because I have different interests. And I find time, I just either put it in an email to myself or if I'm a concept while I'm commuting somewhere and someone else is driving, I just plug in a couple things and then I go back and edit a little bit more. But um, uh, my readers vary from all over and it's been neat because I've actually like followed uh, Jason and other people's blogs. I get ideas, I get inspiration and you have time. So if you don't have time, you can always make time. So it's like the same thought of when people want to start a workout regime, regime. If you want to do it, you can make the time. So you got to you just have to make the time and, and dedicate that time. So I usually pick a couple mornings a week to be reflective for reading and reflective for writing a bit more. So the next question um, I want to put out to um, the group. Anyone can say they want to join in first because we've already covered um, kind of how do you structure your schedule. Um, any suggestions for designing a blog for students rather than professionals? Um, so I, I guess Esther will let you start that off. Um, I guess for us, um, having a, a friendly face, uh, somebody who they could connect with, uh, I think is probably key. Um, you know, with our student bloggers, they actually post, you know, with permission, they posted their own pictures and they uh, talk from their own perspective. Um, so I found that, you know, when we move towards that versus using a mascot, like, you know, right away we had really positive responses from the students. Um, even the voice of the blog, um, the way they write for the blog is a little bit more casual um, so that, you know, they could really connect with the students and I think that that would probably help. And a follow-up, actually, RIT advisor, Academic Advisors Squared um, has a question for you. When students blog, do you suggest or post themes or prompts or give them the freedom to post whatever, whenever? Like, because we all have those higher ed and campus cycles. Um, we have de dates and deadlines as well. So, do you offer themes or ideas, or how do you get them started? So, um, it, you know, it really depends on the time of the year. Uh, you know, for sure, at beginning of the fall. It's going to be about course selection, sometimes about program uh, selection. So uh, between the two blog bloggers right now, um, uh, one blog, one blogger actually focuses on academic and study skills, and the other one actually focuses on career and employment. Um, and we have different cycles for the two different sides of the house. So depending on what's happening, um, they actually pick a theme from um, what's what is important at that moment. So for example, you know, close to November, it could be um, grad school application times, right? So students are going to want to know a little bit more about um, different kind of resources and thoughts about applying to grad school, grad school options. Um, so that could be a blog post. Um, uh, after the winter, there's, you know, the w winter blogs, right? Uh, students who didn't really do well in the fall semester, they want to beef up their study skills. You know, so we might do a blog post on study skill tips. So it's really collaborative. Uh, I do give the students a lot of freedom to, um, uh, to write the blogs, but we do talk about different kind of themes together. Great. Um, and there's a good question, and I can open this to, because Sally talked a little bit about this, and Jason did a, a little bit as well. Um, there's a question around uh, determining um, like metrics. So IUPUI, uh, Jakarta, asked, for those that blog, they ask for students and self, what sort of assessment procedure have you done, or are you looking at hits or page, you, 
page views or other metrics. And this could be students or this could be your community that you're blogging around. So are there other things that you kind of measure or assess with um, your blog? And let's go with Jason first. Um, I, I, you know, knowing where my, my baseline is and what any given, when, when I post something and I, I get a normal response of a, a certain group of people who, who read it, and whether that's be those who subscribe to the blog, and being a personal blog, I, I don't put a lot into the, the metrics of it, you know, how many people are reading, but I think you can see the more important, the more poignant topics when I do post. And those are the ones I kind of, kind of start to flag that may lend credence to. Is there something in a presentation that I can give at some point in the future? Um, so, but overall metrics, you know, being that it is a personal blog, um, not a lot of assessment on it outside of, you know, personal satisfaction that people are looking at it. Sally, do you have thoughts about how do you assess the regions uh, using and tracking on it besides the page views? You have a lot. You had over 9,000. Uh, what other ways do you determine people are using and liking and um, finding their space there? Well, other than the page views and kind of the informal, you know, the, the people coming up to us and saying, yeah, no, I heard about this, and um, seeing that our service projects um, participation has increased in the past couple of years. Uh, we also, um, oh my gosh, I just lost my chain of thought. Uh, we were talking about page views. It's OK. It's oh, all good. Boy. So things that, how do you check it. that the community is valuing what you're doing? Because the blog's been there for a few years. So why, are you, why is it still being the main means of communication and helpful for your group and your community? Okay, got it back. Um, in the conference um, feedback, after you know, after after you attend a conference, Nakata always sends uh, feedback, a, a request for feedback to all the attendees. In the conference feedback, you know, when when you, when Nakata asks, you know, how did you learn about this conference? Um, you know, and the the blog is one of the options there. So we're able to look um, to see the conference attendees, how much they utilize the blog to whether you know it helps them um, decide to attend the conference. Um, I, I, I doubt it, <laughs> but I think it does kind of generate at least excitement towards the conference. And Esther, um, how do you check on? And are there other assessments or evaluations besides the metrics? Um, that's mainly what we look at. Um, we look at number of hits, but also referring URLs. Um, so where they're clicking on to, um, to be referred to our website, um, to our blog, uh, sorry. Um, and also the comments. Um, if, if we've had a few comments, actually more so recently than before. So that's how we uh, figured out that students really like to hear from other students. Um, so that's how you know. Great. Um, and I will share with you, there's a couple things coming up as far as assessment and track on yourself. Um, Nessie, uh, the student, uh, the National Student Engagement Survey, has a new section for 2013 that assesses technology and students. So many of your campuses are tapping into engagement with students. And blogging is just a different medium. Um, so check that out. I, I shared my friend Kevin Guidry's blog post. He worked for the Nessie office. Um, it has a great section on assessment. And and um, if you're looking for ways to kind of track on where your students are, it's very helpful. I will wrap it up. We're coming to our hour. And I know that um, there's been a couple questions we may have missed. So I will leave it that we will share everyone's information. And we'll be sure to connect you um, if you have further questions for any of our great panelists today. Thank you so much for coming. And it was great having you here. We have one more. Um, Technology Tech Talk series tomorrow. It's with George Steele and Clay Schwen. I uh, will be back at the same Tech Talk time tomorrow. And uh, we look forward to following other people's blogs. So be sure to post it to the public chat before you leave and let us know where you're blogging. Thank you, everyone. Have a good, have a good day. Thanks. Bye, guys. <laughs>